Thank you so much, DJ, for that intro. And I just want to take some time to um, go over who our guests are. I mean, I'm sure since you guys are here, you guys, you have all seen um, on the description of the event that we are joined today. Uh, please just give like a nice wave to everyone when I say your name. Oh, okay, DJ is already showing you how to wave. Great. If it could be that enthusiastic, we're gonna have a great time. So we're gonna start with, we have Han Hutchison coming from uh, Community. Can I get a wave, a big wave? Yeah. <laughs> so Han is the Youth Programming Specialist at Community. We also have Megan Yuri Young, big wave. <laughs> Hello, Megan. She, uh, she is the founder of the SAD Collective. We also have Jonathan Reed, Youth Program Manager at NextGen. And look at, yes, very nice. And of course, last but not least, we have Alexa Potashnik, who is the founder of Black Space Winnipeg. Hello, and welcome, a big welcome to our guest panelists, but also to everyone who tuned in tonight. Well, night here in Easter side, but like daytime for you guys in the West. Uh, thank you so much for being here and our very first webinar and uh, the first webinar in this series of distancing together so i'm going to dive right into the questions and first up of course we're going to be looking at who the panelists are and what are their platforms so who are you representing what are you representing today so we're going to start it off with han tell us a little bit about yourself oh my goodness i was hoping i didn't have to go first um, my name is Han, uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm, like you mentioned, the, the specialist in youth programming at Q. So, uh, community is BC's queer, trans, and two-spirit resource centre, um, and our main, our mandate is to connect and serve, uh, the queer community throughout British Columbia. Amazing. Thank you so much, Han, and welcome. And now we're going to go over to Megan. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Megan, and as Taha mentioned, I'm the founder, co-founder of uh, the SAG Collective, and it is an online community for um, anything and everything mental health, which we all know touches all of our lives um, across the board, especially now more than ever when we're all becoming very introspective and um, isolated, I guess, on some levels, although I feel so warm and welcomed right now. Um, so I'll be kind of representing that side. Thank you so much, Megan. And now on to drum roll, Jonathan. Tell us about yourself. Hi, my name is Jonathan. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm the youth program manager for Next Gen Men. Next Gen Men is uh, a Canadian organization <clears throat> whose purpose is empowering and engaging uh, boys and young men to be talking about gender and equality and to sort of see, uh, you know, like to see feminism as like not something that's like happening, like that's separate from boys, you know, and men, but something that affects every single one of us and um, about the people in our lives and our lives as well. So um, we, I personally work with um, the young people that are engaged with Next Gen Men, um, but we do things um, with communities and workplaces as well. Amazing, thank you so much. And last but not least, Alexa, you wanna tell us about yourself? Yes, everyone can hear me? Cool stuff. Hey folks, thank you so much for having me, representing Winnipeg. We're always forgotten across the country, but we exist, we're here. <laughs> um, I'm the founder and president of Black Space Winnipeg. It was started off um, out of the movement and conversation around Black Lives Matter and to bring awareness, attention, and advocacy to Winnipeg's Black community and addressing the history and contemporary discrimination of anti-Black racism in Manitoba. So I started that about Oh my gosh, four years ago now. And um, yeah, wear my activist hat. I am a musician and artist. So I do many things, but I'm so glad to be here and to connect with all you folks. And pronouns she and her. Amazing. Thank you so much. And uh, we see you, Winnipeg. We see you. <laughs> all right. So thank you so much, all the panelists, for sharing that. And now I'm going to dive right into the questions. And since Alexa, I have you right here. I'll ask you the first question. 
why is it important to stay connected now more than ever? Um, you know what? The last, I guess we're going into week eight of this pandemic. Um, has been really eye-opening in terms of how the world and particularly the West is really affected by something. I don't think we've seen anything like this since like the flu, which was a hundred years ago. So it's really interesting to get everyone's um, reaction to something that is fundamentally affecting everyone. And this is, this is no joke. Um, anxiety is through the roof, depression, even for myself. I've dealt with so much night anxiety and just trying to manage this new norm, lack of like going outside and connecting with others. Um, but I think it's really important because it's really easy to get consumed in isolation. It's really easy to convince yourself that no one cares or no one else is going through the same thing you're going through. And just reminding yourself and reaching out to people that you know, you're not in this alone, I think is really important now more than ever. Um, and yeah, just a constant reminder that we have to look out for each other. I've, I've been calling my friends, I've been checking in with my family. Um, just a simple text can help so many people. And uh, yeah, I hope this really wakes our country up and, you know, here in the West that, you know, we have so much privilege and we really need to recognize that things like this are a reality in other countries and, you know, hopefully demonstrate a stronger sense of humanity um, during and after this pandemic and moving forward. Thank you so much, Alexa. That was amazing. Thank you. Han, same question for you. Why do you think it's so important to stay connected now more than ever? Yeah, I think um, I'd like to speak like specifically to the experiences of queer people because that's the demographic that I work with. Um, and the importance of staying connected as a queer person in this pandemic. And I think uh, when, we're, when we're talking about queer youth specifically, um, there's a unique set of barriers that they're facing now that uh, a lot of other people may not be um, because a lot of people are isolating or quarantining uh, with family members that are either maybe unsupportive or just not necessarily affirming of the identity of, of the youth. And I think like specifically in my work, I'm seeing a lot of that now and their connection to queer community virtually is, is honestly like a life-saving thing that can be offered at the moment um, in a way, because, because it's taken away our queer spaces. So our, our queer spaces exist in these cities. I, I live in Vancouver and they're kind of everywhere, um, all of these, these places that people can get together and, and affirm each other and hang out with people that have similar lived identities. Um, and because it's taken away that, that physical space, I think it's really, it's become really important to connect uh, and in a virtual way so that we can mitigate the risk factors and the barriers that, that people are experiencing at the moment. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So uh, I'm going to move on to our next question. And this one is going to be for Megan. What makes a digital community? Oh, wow. Um, what makes a digital community uh, is, I guess it's, it's that sense of solidarity and that messaging and that identity that um, people are searching for. So, you know, when the SAG Collective was created, we, our mandate was to kind of bridge the gap between what we saw as two dichotomies with mental health. We saw kind of the witty, sarcastic, um, I'm super sad, like uh, messaging. And then on the other side, it was like rainbows and sunshine and you know, it's raining today, but the sun will come out tomorrow. And, it, and there was no middle ground. And I felt like if you, in this, in the digital space, if you followed um, either one of those kind of um, spaces, you, when you did feel sad, you did feel like those feelings or emotions were validated. Um, and then when you were happy, it, and, but you're reading all these like anxious or depressive, or I guess, like I said, kind of like darker, sarcastic uh, memes, they weren't necessarily, you weren't necessarily um, responding to that either. And so I think there's that that like what's your mission 
what's what's almost I love I um, being more in the uh, community space now and volunteering. Um, I've come up with like I've learned. I think it was actually Athi is boring taught me this in the Rise program, being an ambassador um, of community agreements. Uh, and and so that to me is a huge pillar to digital communities because that's where um, you really have to kind of create this mission that people will understand why they're following you or why they're listening to this community or be, want to be part of this community. But that really truly does extend from the physical space as well. So I think the real, really strong um, communities in the digital, digital space, I can't say that word digital, <laughs> um, really stem from um, understanding what uh, relationships are in general. Like it shouldn't really change that much um, from a physical space to a digital space. I think I got better there. It should, um, kind of like feed off of each other. And I think that's one of the things that I was so excited about this year was to do more um, IRL experiences for SAC Collective. I even, you know, did a speed dating for therapists earlier this year. And then, and now I'm like, I feel forced back into a digital space, but I realize it, there is that community there and um, we just have to be open and willing and understand why we want to be part of it. Yeah. Just to jump onto that, Megan, I feel like, the advantage with um, digital communities and like meme culture sometimes is that meme culture or you know the humor behind um, or or alive on the digital space often creates a sense of shared um, experience or lived experience. So I know that at Apathy is Boring, um, when we post our memes, when we when we look for for lighter content to to post those are often the ones that resonate the most with folks and that reach the most people because sometimes, you know, a, a meme might actually describe perfectly well what someone um, can't necessarily verbalize. A hundred percent. And just um, I, one more thing that I'll say, and then after that, I'll, I'm sure there'll be more questions that I can touch on it or, or the rest of the panelists can touch on. Um, I think I, I'm very uh, strongly believe in the, the uh, relationship between um, in person and digital uh, communities, because there really is that danger of um, seeing a one dimensional thing when it's digital and either falling into the traps of comparison or judgment. Um, so that's why I think I, I, I really wanted to focus on the community agreements and having a very strong mission and having a very strong identity. But I love the fact that you brought up meme culture because that. I feel like that just brings so much lightness to people's day even now. Like, I don't know, I can't even tell you how many DM groups and even texts where we're just sharing all these memes um, and just getting our th ourselves through these times. I, yeah, I said these times. I promised myself I wouldn't say that, but I've said it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan. Yeah, super relatable. Memes, memes are also the ways that I uh, communicate with my family. Um, a lot of my cousins are very young, so they live in this. And now I had to learn the language. So <laughs> that is how we get by. Um, but yeah, I want to ask the same question to Jonathan. What, uh, what's your little input? What, uh, what does it mean to have a digital community? What makes it? Um, man, I was like kind of hoping the cry is like, mm, that's a tough one. Um, community, I think, can look like a lot of different things. Um, but my input would be that one of the tenets of community for me um, is it, I would say I belong to a community if I'm going to show up for it. Like if I'm going to be there um, when there's need. Um, and, uh, and that can mean a lot of different things, right? It can mean like anything from like calling a friend to like civil disobedience. There's all kinds of different ways that you can show up. Um, and I think that what's a little bit different when you think of a digital, when I think of a digital community, is that showing up just looks a little different. And um, so maybe that's a webinar. Kudos to everybody here. Um, an example that I would give is that we put a bunch of work with NextGen and we put a bunch of work into figuring out how we can adapt our normal school-based program to existing in an online format. Um, knowing that it's still a very important time to be supporting boys' mental health, to su be supporting their connections to other people. Um, 
And, but because we're not in schools, we're not um, being supported by ins any institutions. And that meant that the program would have to have a cost. And so we turned to our community and said, we have this idea of, of creating this community of boys. Um, we want it to be accessible and we want boys that wouldn't, you know, that maybe wouldn't have the funds for it to be able to access it. And there were members of our community who stepped forward and offered donations and sponsorship um, in, order us for to make, in order for us to make that possible. And we're running it with a number of boys who have spaces and are able to participate. Um, some, like, for example, anyway, so yeah, we have boys that are participating through the support of our community. And um, to me, that's like an example of like what community looks like um, is, is like, there's a sense of like action there rather than, um, for, I can't think of a better word, but rather than passivi passivity, if that's a word. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Subtle plug there. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Jonathan. D did anybody else want to answer this really beautiful question that everyone is super excited to answer? Han, I feel like I feel like you want to answer this. You have you have an answer. There you go. That smile. I mean, I, I don't know if smiling means I want to answer it. I'm just I'm just supportively smiling. Um, I don't have, I feel like it's been answered pretty well, but I think specifically in terms of like my demographic, it, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about before in that like community is such a huge word. And I think it ties into a lot of like concepts within the queer community of like chosen family for people that aren't necessarily accepted within their family of origin. And I think when we're talking about what makes a community uh, we're again talking about like how we are continuing to affirm people um, in a digital way um, and and create those spaces that we're creating when we're not in a pandemic um, and in in the best ways we can kind of kind of make that happen in a way that works for everyone um, and when we're, we're talking about youth as well we're, we're talking about uh, more, the most accessible way to to communicate with youth because youth might not want to email and sit down and kind of do the more traditional ways to do it. Um, and you to have already have their own communities out there. It's just a matter of, of networking and finding out how like service providers can, can tap into that and ways that we can support through that. Yeah. I think accessibility is a really good point you bring up Han, especially for um, either marginalized or at risk youth who already have barriers to engagement in real life. Um, so ensuring that you limit those barriers digitally, but also manage like the safe space up, um, that comes into that because the digital space isn't always obviously the safest. Um, whereas for queer folks or um, BIPOC folks, we're very much used to safe space and we create a lot of safe space so that folks can feel um, seen and heard. So I guess a question, extend a question to you um, and or to Alexa, since you, you, you two kind of deal with marginalized folks, how do you ensure um, or try to, to at least mitigate the safeness um, online? Mm. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I guess I can. My mic's off. <laughs> yeah, how this like directly mute? <laughs> I'm wait for this. Damn. You know, that's hard because trolls are real, and trolls are everywhere online. Um, I'll give an example. Last year, uh, we experienced a really public uh, and pretty violent reaction online to. Um, our and our yeah our annual um, hockey team has a, a party every year called a whiteout, and everyone dresses in white and they come downtown and they drink and it's predominantly like white suburbanites coming downtown to drink and do whatever they want and push out all the vulnerable communities and um, people who are affected by homelessness, indigenous communities, newcomers to Canada who predominantly live in downtown Winnipeg's downtown core. And the gist of the party is supposed to be fun and inclusive to everyone. But our argument was there's a lot of folks who don't come from these 
communities who don't feel safe in these type of crowds. Um, and we just put out uh, a message saying if this party is, you know, a party for everyone, we should probably think about how to make it safe for everyone in Winnipeg. And there, there, I wasn't expecting the amount of public and online backlash that we got um, from, I think the comments reached like 60,000 people or the posts reached 60,000 people in like um, 12 hours and like all these news outlets were saying, oh, well, is our party racist and is hockey racist? And, you know, it turned into this huge conversation about race. And what we were talking about was safety. Our communities don't feel safe in a large crowd where everyone's wearing white, predominantly white people getting drunk and acting a fool. And we should probably have a conversation how to make this safe for everyone. Um, and yeah, Winnipeg had a very nasty and violent reaction to it. But I think if you're not pushing the envelope and, you know, questioning the status quo, then things are never going to change. So it might have been complicated to deal with in that moment. But I think online, you'll get, you'll still see so many people are stuck in a very um, discriminatory mindset. Um, a lot of people aren't willing to change. A lot of people aren't willing to have these deep and um, sometimes and mostly very uncomfortable conversations about racism, sexism, ableism, and the intersections that, you know, um, govern and police the, w the ways in which we live in this society, in this country. Um, so I think, I don't know, I, I think it's important. It's, it's, it's valid to see those trolls and those things happening online because you still see that we have so much work to do as activists, as community leaders, as organizers, and people who constantly um, challenge the systems that are at large in this country. Han, do you want to take it away? Well, I'll also add, I was just going to say, um, I'm not commenting on the safety thing, but I was going to say to Alexa, um, you all, by also, I've never thought about this. This literally just occurred to me now. By also um, seeing the trolls, it means that your message got to the right audience. It, so it, it sucks that um, there were trolls, that there was negativity. But what I, over the last year or two, I've been more focused on like, okay, cool. This is so great that we have communities. Um, this is just beyond digital. This is just in general. Um, you know, from feminism to LGBTQ to uh, Black and everything, like, but are we just talking to each other sometimes, I wonder. So when you access the trolls, unfortunately, it just means you're actually, you are, you're getting beyond your circle and it's unfortunate and it's uncomfortable and sometimes very scary um, and violent, but, um, and I, I thankfully have never really had to deal with that. Um, speaking about mental health, which affects everyone. Um, so I can't even imagine what that would look like to mitigate that. But I don't know, I was just looking on the positive side. <laughs> okay, thank you. Todd, you wanna continue? Yeah, um, I think Han was gonna say something. I wasn't sure if you wanted to take it. <laughs> I'm not sure either. <laughs> I think I just wanted to like, kind of a lot of what Alexa was saying um, is is applicable to marginalized communities everywhere. And I think it, it's a difficult question because when we're talking about virtual and online safety um, and youth, it's obviously something that we want to make sure we're doing to the best possible extent that we can um, in order to protect protect those that are most vulnerable and marginalized. Um, and I think like in a practical sense, the way that I go about that is, is connecting with youth that I already have relationships with and the communities that they're a part of and being really mindful of the ways in which I continue to connect with them, such as like really closed Facebook groups and things like that. Um, and I think it's also really important just to ask people what makes them feel safe. Um, it's, it's such a simple thing that that you can do, but particularly when we're talking about younger, marginalized folks, um, it's a question that sometimes they don't get asked a whole lot. 
And I think it's really important to, to ask people like what, what would make your space feel safer? And is that a principle that we can apply to an online or a digital community in this time moving forward? Yeah, that's really helpful. I feel like um, also determining which spaces are safe to be open. So such as this, this, this is an open space where, you know, we are um, very clearly opening up our filter bubbles. Um, and then I think that there are certain conversations um, that deserve closed spaces, such as, you know, a Facebook group, a closed Zoom group, um, a closed DM group, et cetera, um, where you can kind of maybe maintain the, the safeness of it all. All right, Tom. Thank you. Thank you so much for those beautiful answers. We're going to be moving on to the next question. I'm going to ask Jonathan, what is the role of social media during this pandemic? Now that we're all trying to connect digitally, how big is this online social media game? Um, it's a little bit bittersweet um, because I think the role of social media is um, to some extent like the medium of conversation or the media of conversation um, to um, be able to engage with each other um, in a bit more of like an interactive way. And the reason that's kind of bittersweet is because it's really not the same um, as like direct communication. And I would say that particularly like for me, like engaging with an online group is not the same as engaging with a physical group of boys and you're sharing that space with them. And there's like emotional energy and like relational energy that um, just like has a really hard time translating. Um, so conversation would be a big thing and that I find kind of bittersweet. Um, another like really important thing is like, I'd say advocacy. Um, so to be like on my end, like we're, we care about like gender issues. And so to be saying like, what's going on with domestic violence these days? Um, what might isolation mean for the mental health of vulnerable people? Um, how might like gender hierarchies be exacerbated by um, working and living in the same place? Um, those kinds of things that um, we can like, I guess they kind of go hand in hand, like further that conversation and like, pop, like hopefully like participate in advocacy and social media is a really good place for that. Um, it's a place to find connection with other people. Um, and yeah, I think all those things kind of go hand in hand. But like I said, um, there is a sense of loss in saying that. And um, so um, I don't think it's a, a perfect solution. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask the same question to Megan. You have a very strong online presence and so does the SAD Collective. And uh, so how important and what is the role that social media is playing in the way that you connect with your audience? So I'm going to echo a lot of, I might, I actually won't echo. I agree with so much that Jonathan said. Um, and funny enough about, oh, about two or three years ago, I personally decided to um, clean out my, what I was following, what I was paying attention to. I like to actually say it's right. The currency of attention. Um, and when I kind of, re-looked at what I was consuming online um, I and I and I shifted it I realized I focused more on advocacy on on art and creativity on um, my friendships and um, and then of course leaders that I just looked up to and that really shifted my mindset and shifted my relationship with social media personally from like a personal standpoint that I see to this day, so many people still struggle with. Um, it can be very, I think Alexa mentioned how it can be such a negative, negative area. Um, and you see that in so many ways. And now uh, it's been really beautiful actually to see people utilize all these different types of tools and platforms uh, from IG lives where they're just having like, they're interviewing the people that they admire. I've seen people interviewing people they've admired for decades or years or months even um, to like, you know, baking, baking and fitness and um, all of these amazing ways to express yourself. Um, 
And then on the flip side, you see the judgment of that people saying, oh, there's too much baking and there's too much fitness and there's too much of this sharing. And um, again, I, it always comes back to like, well, what are you paying attention to? You have control over what you pay attention to. And to be completely transparent, I've been very inactive, both on my personal social media um, and unfortunately a little bit on the SAG Collective because I've been experiencing tech fatigue. Um, I've been experiencing um, where I just, I just, I, I read this really great article and I know it floated around. So if anyone um, has read it, if I can find it, I know Taha was asking me for resources and I was um, a little late on that, but I, if I find the link, I'll send it. Um, but it was talking about Zoom actually. And I would say um, Zoom in a very specific way, like uh, community and socializing, not just like these types of gatherings or meetings. It was in the kind of social um, friendship relationships. And um, there was this fatigue in this, in this drain on your emotional um, capacity to keep having these types of uh, FaceTiming or Zoom, meet or Zoom uh, parties. And it was because um, I love this sentence. It was like, we are used to being in the presence of presence and in the absence of, and in the pre absence of absence, but we're not used to being in the presence of absence. I think, I don't quote me completely. I'll try to find the article, but it's just this, it's by being in these spaces, digital spaces, um, we're seeing the um, disconnect between the physical relationship and the, and then like these digital relationships and it can be very exhausting. So that being said, though, when we focus on um, advocacy, having a voice, um, those little moments of connection that really does um, make us feel less alone means <laughs> um, there's there's beauty in that. And I think that will carry us through and thank goodness this has happened. Although I do think we would have survived perfectly well and people have and societies have survived perfectly well without social media in the past and so it's really just what I say and this is where um, you have to hone your intuition and this is the perfect time to do that is just internally look what is good for you for me personally it's been to step back I've needed to step back it's been too much I'm actually going to be announcing like a letter writing uh, session not a workshop just like if anyone wants to sit down with me and write letters to our loved ones on Friday I think I'm going to make it um, it's just like something uh, that I'll obviously announce on on social media that I'll probably conduct over zoom but then you're kind of putting pen to paper I think there's all these different things. And I, I don't know, I went on a big tangent, so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> and I hope I answered the question. <laughs> I think what I, what I take away from your, from your answer is really um, the power of being intentional with how we use our social media. So really um, choosing who we follow, choosing um, what we pay attention to, and curating our timelines so that they feel good um, to us when we do spend time and if we are going to spend time um, on it. And then the flip side of that um, is that, you know, there's a lot right now. There's a lot of Zooming in and IGing in and FaceTiming. And so being able to recognize when that's too much for you and, and, and being able to disconnect in order to better reconnect. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. I totally want to echo that. And I also want to say that I have never baked as much as I did in the past few weeks. And uh, I don't know what to do with so much banana bread, but it's there. So <laughs> thank you so much for sharing. Moving on, I'm going to ask this question to Alexa. What are the approaches that you're using to continuously engage with your audience right now? Um, a lot of daily challenges are really fun to get folks engaged. I love throwing in a good uh, throwback or flashback Friday, get conversations going. I'm really into like, um, you know, so much of, so much, well, I can't even say like almost all of meme culture, popular culture, mainstream, mainstream culture is inspired or influenced by black culture. So anything on like TikTok or Instagram or these, the, a lot of these dance challenges, like, come out a lot of influencers, like black influencers from the States. And they're just giving us, like always, black people are always giving us the tools to 
on the language that we need and how to cope in these times. And I think like whatever kind of challenge it is, that's been really helpful. Um, also, we're, all, we're thinking about launching it, an online uh, mental health support group um, for Black folks in Winnipeg. Um, our program before was called Project Heal, and it was a space where Black people can come connect and deal with a lot of anxiety and depression around, um, specifically di directed from a lot of anti-Black racism they were facing and the effects of racism on your mental health. So much lot, like so much of the frontline workers right now who are going through, just going through it, whether they're working at in healthcare or the grocery store or any essential service, um, Black communities are getting hit 10 times harder because of the lack of resources and help and just awareness from the government, um, from other essential services. Um, not so much, I think, in Canada, but specifically when I'm looking at in the States, like the coronavirus has really affected Black communities and Black death has been increasing. And I think that's something to really keep in mind in these pandemic times, like who has that privilege to stay home, who's still working from home, who doesn't have to go risk their health and work at an essential service job right now. So um, yeah, that that Project Heal has been something that we're trying to move on an online platform. And what does that look like? Um, and also too, like you mentioned with Zoom, we still have to keep some sort of confidentiality. So, you know, working around that. But yeah, like to engage our online folks, like daily challenges, quizzes, um, song challenges, anything to just get you out of your anxiety funk, uh, I think is really important. And just to remind people that you're not alone, you're not the only one going through this, and that's going to help us really hopefully get through this pandemic, however long it'll last, you know, we're all in this together. Thank you so much, Alexa. I'm going to ask uh, the same question now to Jonathan, because uh, your so next gen men on their instagram you guys are making these survival kits and they are getting a lot of engagement on those posts so tell us a little bit about how you're using that to keep the conversation going within your community um so the idea for the survival guys which are um directed at youth um and particularly directed at boys to say yeah like things are kind of weird right now um and here are some like tips on like how to get through some of the things that make social distancing and, and um, you know, the crisis a little bit more difficult. Um, first of all, they were inspired by a podcast called Let's Talk Bruh, um, uh, which I highly recommend, as well as um, an Instagram account called Max Gets Curious, um, which is um, uh, sort of like focused on LGBTQ youth. So credit to those folks for kind of leading the way on that. Um, the purpose was because like I've been having a lot of conversations with young guys that are like, I'm way more bored than I ever thought I would be, you know, or I miss my friend. I like, literally haven't seen my friends in a month. And, um, and there was like a sense, I don't know if I'd say helplessness, but there was a sense of like um, uncertainty, um, you know, cause it's like, it's not, it's not a tragedy for a lot of young people. It's just kind of like a little bit off. They're like a little bit lonely, you know, or a little bit, anxious and um so the purpose of those guides was to say like we get it you know you don't have sports teams anymore and like that actually is pretty disarming um and so here's some tips on on that to be honest when i was writing them and researching them and preparing for them i um often just thought like what would what kind of advice would i need myself like i kind of resonate with um what megan was saying about um tech fatigue that's like a really real thing that like, sure, it exists on like a professional level, but like when Megan sort of described it, like, I'm like, I totally, like I literally just went on Snapchat all weekend because I just like, was like, ugh, I can't, you know? So a lot of the things that I came up with were things that I was doing or things that um, I would have appreciated being told. And um, they're kind of step one in a bit of a way because I've seen basically every organization and company on the planet come up with like resources for COVID-19. If you go on any website, it's like right at the top, like something, something COVID-19 and then click for resources. And um, I'm like kind of bored at that point of, of that kind of thing. But the survival guide, um, first of all, is like in a medium, it's in a space that youth are accessing on Instagram. Um, and it's like an opening 
to the conversation. So one of the young people in our youth program right now messaged me <clears throat> because I shared it on my own Instagram and he messaged me and said, like Jonathan to the rescue. And then he was like, actually, these are pretty good ideas. Um, so the idea for it for me is that it's like, it is a resource which um, is useful for some people, not that useful for others, um, but that it's the start of a conversation. It's the start of either like an internal conversation of like, how can I think more critically about like the support that I need to give myself in this time? Or like, how can I continue to engage with like, whether it's like me or my organization or the work that I'm doing? Um, I don't know if that really answered the question, <laughs> but that's kind of the process and, and that's what's been happening. What that's I love, great. Jonathan, stay on there. What I love about it is I also created a survival guide um, for, uh, it was a stay home survival guide and I just took a peek at yours and it's so good. It, I, I love the humor in it. I love like, I think there was one slide that I saw was like uh, master, like a kick a kickflip I don't know something like that or become a DJ and like the rationale behind mine too was like step like the this is like the beginning point of for anyone who's never worked from home like this is how you can maybe um fill your time but I did it from a, a, like more of a mental health like a um, angle and so I started with restfulness mindfulness wellness and then I ended with like creativity and product productivity and stuff like that because I wanted to be like nice. um and I'm glad I did it that way because weeks after you see people, one of the biggest things that I saw about online communities was um, don't tell me how to live my life. Like, don't tell me I need a tie dye. Don't tell me I need a bake. Don't tell me I need to do this in order to, don't tell me I need to like write a book um, or be like create a new side hustle. And I was like, thank God I started with restfulness because um, of that element that I guess I was, I guess I just, I don't know. Anyhow, I went with my instinct, but I love that you created one as well. And, and obviously there are tons of resources out there. And one I'm just going to throw out to the panelists, I've been playing with and I even just started designing it, but I, I've been too nervous to create it, but I want to create a resource for intolerable quarantine um, to touch on domestic abuse, um, intolerable mm -hmm. LGBT uh, households. Um, and then I didn't even think, well, I, I did think about minorities, but I, I, I kind of stopped because I was like, this is too overwhelming, but maybe with everyone's input and if you have, um, and maybe it can be like a, a national thing rather than more of an Ontario, because I'm from Mon Toronto, um, Ontarian thing. Um, that's another resource that we can tackle together. I love that um, we all have that same idea. Cool. You, you see what you just did? You just built a digital community of panelists. <laughs> <laughs> making making great things happen <laughs> on a national scale. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, before I ask our last question for the panel session and we break out, I just wanted to uh, remind for all of the folks who are new who just got in a little bit later after we've started and had our intro and a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I don't know if you have been paying attention to Andrew's messaging on the chat, but uh, we are going to be taking, so like if you have any questions while the panelists are talking, you can direct them to Andrew, apathy is boring, dash Andrew, and um, he will share it with us, but we will only be asking the participant questions after we come back from the breakout session when it's uh, participant question time. So I, we have noted down all of your questions. We will ask them uh, right afterwards. So, and also I would urge everyone to have their layout uh, of their screen on speaker view so that you can see the panelist who is speaking and uh, without being a little bit distracted with like all of the windows of everybody tuning in. So uh, thank you again for coming and we're gonna continue for last question. I'm gonna go to Han and I'm going to ask you, how can we continue what we've built online, offline after the pandemic? I've been saving this one for you. <laughs> great, it feels great. <laughs> I mean, I think that's an interesting question because I think there's been some unexpected benefits, uh, particularly when working within queer community um, in, and specifically with accessibility, uh, with all of the, the online, and kind of virtual ways that we've been connecting. I think we're seeing a lot of people access our services now that might live remotely or might not have access to a community um, generally or have access to those spaces that maybe cities like Vancouver or Toronto um, do have. And I think 
it's been surprising and it probably shouldn't have been surprising um, the amount of barriers that it has removed for those folks that are pretty disconnected from things and that are now able to access, you know, support groups specific to their identity or be able to talk to people um, in ways that they weren't before because those, those groups are now online. Um, and I think we're all pretty guilty of it in one way or another in, in kind of specifying services to, to the city in which we're based in um, and our organisation because we do have a BC mandate um, but I think it's really opened our eyes about how we can do better at serving the vulnerable people because they do have more barriers if they're not living in a larger city. And I think the ways in which we can keep that online connectedness uh, should be, first of all, I think we need to have a discussion about how we can continue the connections that we've made and how we can not lose that sense of belonging for the people that have been able to access it for the first time. And having a think about the ways, I mean, I think this pandemic has taught us a lot of different things, uh, not necessarily all like professional things, but have, has taught us all a lot about kind of ourselves. Um, but just like the ways that we can continue to relate to each other in, in a beneficial way, uh, specifically with marginalized communities and maybe ways that we can keep those services going and not shut them all down um, when everything's back open again, which would actually be really harmful for the folks that are now able to access it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think, um, I think also like for us at Apathy is Boring, our mandate has always been like it's pan-Canadian, right? So um, a lot of the challenges are with uh, especially like our RISE program, as um, DJ was mentioning before, where we live in these uh, hub cities across Canada and we serve the youth in those cities. I think you're absolutely right about like changing the online game where us as comms, we can create all this content that could be accessible to youth and to people all over Canada, no matter where they live, who we'll have access to internet and can get on and see this content. But the actual work of like building the in-person communities, it comes and it becomes more limiting when, you know, uh, in one province we exist in one space and then the, 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 the physical distance that they actually have to come and be a part of the physical community is definitely a barrier. And it's something that, you know, I think a lot of us organizations that are pa like pan-Canadian or just national, we're trying to overcome. And uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that's a, always like a conversation that we also have within our organization, within our comms team, within our programs. So um, it's good to keep the conversation going and come up with, um, come up with uh, solutions together as partners and as organization in Canada. So thank you so much. So for now, I am going to uh, ask Andrew to um, break out all of our participants into random groups. Uh, so again, for the groups, the breakout session, the point of this is that you get to connect with other participants who are also here in this webinar and together, you come up with one question to ask the panelists, either one panelist or the entire panel, um, and you designate a spokesperson who it will then be asking that question um, when we call upon them. So make sure that once the question is set, you send it to Andrew, apathy is boring dash Andrew. Uh, there's also another person, Andrew here, not to that Andrew, to the apathy is boring Andrew. Um, so that we can then move on to the next part and uh, ask these questions directly to our panelists. Kendra, do you want to kick us off? Awesome. Um, that was so neat and cool. Um, and it was great to meet everybody. And I was saying, I think I'm the only one representing the East Coast. So happy to be here and am doing my best. Our question um, is not directed at anybody in particular. So whoever would like to jump in, go for it. How do we reach people with limited access to so-called basic resources, such as internet, Wi-Fi, and technology? And on top of that, how do we account for language barriers? From my state, from my um, platform, I literally just do a call out. Um, and I'm, I, I, once a year at least, maybe more, um, I'll just, on any platform that I have, like Facebook or Instagram, 
um, for the SAG Collective, I'll be like, who wants to share their story? And I'm always pleasantly surprised. I think um, Han had met, I think it was Han that mentioned, like, sometimes we forget to just ask. Um, and you'd be surprised at who responds um, and who wants to share their, their story or share something. So it can be as simple as that, but that's the only one that I've really, if I think about it, have tried. <laughs> Does anybody else want to add to that? I can add just really briefly um, in that it's, it's interesting in that, like, because everything's virtual now, a lot of those barriers around, um, like, anxiety or shyness that people have uh, relating in person are actually and naturally kind of falling away to a certain extent. And obviously that's not the case uh, for everyone. So th that can translate to virtual online communities. But I would probably uh, agree with Megan in, in kind of putting call-outs and asking. And I think in itself, we are making it more accessible by being virtual. Um, and I know that's not necessarily answering the question, um, but I think that's kind of my experience working with young people so far um, within COVID. Great. Thank you guys so much. I'm just going to acknowledge that it's 634. Um, so I, while I did want to leave time for open questions, um, 35 now I think maybe what we can do is the questions that were left um, unanswered from folks um, that they submitted we can collect them and maybe share them with the participants and have them respond to that then we can share back maybe in a follow-up email um, just to be cognizant of folks time and screen time also good okay so we're gonna wrap it up with a little um, rapid fire and Taha's going to lead that for us. Yeah, so we're going to keep it super short. So I'm going to ask, I think we, we, we just brainstormed today. And we're like, we have so many cool questions to ask. So I'm going to keep it to three. And you guys have to tell me the first thing that comes to your mind one after this. So we're going to go with Han first, then Jonathan, then Megan, then Alexa. Okay, so that's the order of answers. I will ask three questions. So the first question is, so fill in the blanks. Youth involvement is important because, Han, go. Is it like a one word answer or <laughs> I'm just panicking? A couple of words. <laughs> uh, um, because they are able to participate in their own lives. Great. Jonathan. Um, youth involvement is what? Can you repeat one word? Important. Youth involvement is important because? Important because youth are going to change um, every broken thing that we've got right now. Amazing. Megan? They are the future. And Alexa, youth involvement is important because? Uh, they will reshape the narratives that came before us. Amazing. Very nice. All right. So now you get to pick one. What is your favorite digital platform for community building? So let's go back to Han. Um, I feel like Instagram is working quite well. Okay. And Jonathan? Um, Instagram for youth. Um, personally, I really like Twitter. Amazing. And Megan? For me specifically, it's Instagram. And then uh, for more private stuff, Zoom. And Alexa? Instagram all the way. I love Instagram. It's the best one. <laughs> We better be catching all of you doing some live soon. Okay, share that with us. I want to see what that's looked like. <laughs> all right, final question. Final question. One thing that, bring, that is bringing you joy these days. So name one thing that is helping you go through all of what we're going through today. And so, Han, take it away. Uh, my cat is just right behind me asleep. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? Oscar. Oh, yeah. So cute. All right, Jonathan, what's bringing you joy these days? I was able to um, leave Toronto. I'm living at my parents' house, um, which is a 400-acre property in the countryside. So really long bike rides, um, trail rides, and I'm currently building a rock climbing wall. Oh, okay. Living the life, I see. Kirk, that's yeah. great. Okay, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my dog 
who has been there this whole time and um random hobbies like I actually just finished a puzzle and then I destroyed it which has been so satisfying like finishing <laughs> it with the last piece in and then just destroying it um so just hobbies yeah like knitting and just like getting back to like maker maker moments amazing I want to start a puzzle too oh Alexa what's bringing you joy uh, music, my mom, exercise, and my friends. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for participating in this really, really hot, 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 rapid fire round. Thank and so um, yeah, DJ is going to. This is yeah, the end of it, guys. 40. So I'm going to wrap up really quickly by thanking you guys for your time, um, both the speakers and the participants. Um, I know that it's a lot of Zooming. It's a lot of sitting down. So I don't want to add to it. Um, I also want to encourage folks, um, youth who are online right now, or who, are, who are listening to us right now, that are aged 18 to 30 and who are looking for ways to get involved or looking um, for meaningful ways to have an impact to apply to our RISE program. Applications for our fall cohort are currently um, open. We have a lot of ambassadors that also... Um, are on the call right now. And then the chat right now is also open for folks to send in questions if you want any more pointed questions. So thank you guys so much. Please stay safe. Please be well. Um, take care of yourselves.